Hi, and welcome to our Facebook Live tour of the Archaeology Lab at Michigan Technological University. Um, we are standing right now in front of the Academic Offices building, which houses the Social Sciences Department. And the Archaeology Lab, strangely enough, is not in, this, in the Academic Offices building. It's actually in the AOB Annex. So we are going to walk over there and go on this tour. So the Industrial Archaeology Program is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. Um, started by several faculty who recognized the need to help people understand the history of human use of technology and to excavate a more modern human history. So the, the faculty have done research in places like Cold Spring, New York, excavating um, a foundry that made locomotives and cannons. They've also excavated a range light keeper's house up in Copper Harbor. They have also done excavations in you know, South America, kind of all over the world. We were just treated to a story about scorpions and cobras and people's suitcases from excavations. Um, so I'm going to be passing you off now to Lou Ann Wurst, who is a professor of archaeology here at Michigan Tech. And she's going to introduce you to the annex and its lovely wonders within. Hi, and welcome to the Academic Office Building Annex. This is the Archaeology Labs. That's why the sign says that. We're excited to have you here today because we finished renovations of the Archaeology Labs uh, last year so that we had more opportunities for research and student projects. So, would you like to see what we're doing? When you walk in the door, this is the uh, what, what archaeologists call the wet lab. This is where all the dirt and muck and chemicals go. When we are working in the field, all the artifacts come through this room first because there's sinks where we can wash artifacts. Um, we have you know fume hoods and kilns for experimental archaeology. Um, all of the infrastructure to um, preserve and reconstruct artifacts to do experimental archaeology. And right now we've. Um, working on the project to finish up from our archaeological field school this summer up in Copper Harbor. And this is James Schwatter. He's a PhD student in the industrial archaeology program that was the field supervisor for the work in Copper Harbor. All right, thanks, Luanne. So, welcome to the annex. Um, as Luanne was mentioning, in this location, we're able to bring the artifacts once they're recovered from the field and further analyze, clean if necessary, and then identify these artifacts. And archaeology is best taught to students through our field school as an active process. So we're engaging in excavation and learning and research kind of simultaneously. And we've laid out for you a sample of some of the artifacts we found this summer from Copper Harbor. This small collection came from a site known as the Astor House, which was originally a storehouse owned by the Pittsburgh and Boston Mining Company, later became a small hotel, housed a printing press, and we can see um, Right here, some smoking pipe fragments, a little bit of ceramics, and some nails that were used in the construction of the site. So not a lot of material found, but we found out a lot about the structure, including its location, and possibly some of the activities like smoking, which was a very common thing for people to engage in at the time. Uh, the rest of these artifacts we found came from the range light keeper's house. The range lights help guide ships into the harbor there in Copper Harbor along with the lighthouse and had a keeper's house that maintained these lights uh, from the 1860s through 1937 when electricity was added. And on this side of the table we can see everything again from smoking pipe fragments to glass bottles here, uh, ceramics like this wash basin on the end of the table. And then we also found, this is a uh, actually a Bosch beer bottle that we found in the dump associated with the site. And then this is a kerosene can to light uh, the original range lights and while it's great that we found a lot of stuff that isn't as important as what we find out about this stuff so the research that uh, students at all levels and professors as well engage in in this process that's a really important thing is the information that we learn about this to then help tell stories about the people who lived at these sites right now what we're working on we have two of our field school students here Morgan and Cooper uh, they're currently working on processing a soil sample we took from the Privy, which is one of the locations that we excavated. Um, and this is part of the future work that's going on for this site right now. Uh, they're working on this, we're working on a field report, 
And then we're also working on a conference presentation at the Midwest Archaeology Conference. So students are not only able to take classes that look at archaeology, engage in field work, but they're also able to engage in research and then present that at academic conferences here. So the next room is what we call the, the research lab. So once all the artifacts are processed, this becomes a place where we can work to identify, to catalog the artifacts, to work on individual research projects. And um, this is Matthew DeRocher, who's one of a master's student in industrial archaeology that's been working in the lab um, this semester. Okay, well, thanks, Luann. So welcome to the research lab. So as you can see, we've got some artifacts laid out. And um, Michigan Tech actually is a repository for many collections. Iowa Alpha National Forest, Ottawa National Forest, among others. Um, a lot of it's in the Upper Peninsula, but we also have some projects that were taken, uh, such as the West Point Foundry in, um, or was that the, on the Hudson River? Uh, pretty cool project. Um, but I'm currently working on the Hiawatha National Forest collections here, and it's funded through a grant that they have provided to reorganize as well as um, digitize their collections into a database. So, that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, it's a great opportunity for students to actually get hands-on work with this stuff. I mean, you can see that I mean, we've got some little pieces of ceramics that we can work with. It isn't always exciting, but it can be very exciting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> More often than not, actually. But it's a great project to be able to work on. So part of, part of part of what we're doing is, is archaeology is one of the few sciences that's disruptive. You know, when you excavate a site, you actually destroy it. So we have, we have this kind of moral imperative to maintain collections for future researchers. You know, different questions, different research. And so we have all of these collections, but what we've discovered is the way they're organized is by the year the collection was generated. So the Forest Service has all these people out working and they send us the boxes from 2006, you know. So they could visit the same site 10 times and then the collections are all really separated into these different boxes. So what Matthew is doing is literally going through every box, reorganizing the entire collection so that if somebody says, hey, I'm gonna do some research on, you know, lumber camps that date to the 1920s we can say okay from our database here's the five sites that you might be interested in looking at and we can pull those artifacts out really easily so we're hoping that through this process we not only have a better organization but that it'll lead to larger comparative research where we can actually see what we have and say okay what do we know about lumber camps in the Hiawatha over a 50-year period of time Lillian, um, we've had um, actually some questions come in and one person is wondering, when did Michigan Tech get an archaeology lab? Oh, well, so, so I'm not sure how long we've had a lab, but I do know that this is the 25th anniversary of the Industrial Heritage and Archaeology Program, so part of what we're doing is gearing up towards our 25-year um, celebration. You know, archaeology, you teach archaeology, it's got to be hands-on, and so you have to have labs. So, you know, my guess is that uh, Tech had archaeology labs as you know, long as they had archaeologists on faculty. And I don't know that if that's the 25 years or actually spans longer than that. Mm -hmm. But you, you have, a, you know, many years of material here now. Oh, we have over 40 years of material yeah. in the basement, you know, in our collections. Can and you tell us a small. little bit about these? Well, here's just a few things. You know, we've got some stoneware drugs here. Um, and then, of course, bottles are always, everybody loves bottles. We found some pretty cool things. I'm a musician myself, and I love cowbells. So we're going to run with the cowbells. But this one's pretty interesting because it was actually altered on the inside with a bolt and a nut. So that's a little interesting. We have a clock here, a compass, and then here are some musical reeds. Um, these ones are for harmon harmonicas, and this one could be either from a concertina or an accordion. And this is actually a project that I've been working on for my thesis work. But it's a very broad collection. I mean, we've got a lot of different things from prehistoric as well as historic. So we, we often joke that this project is a lot like Christmas every day, because every time Matthew grabs a box and opens it up, you never know what's going to be in it. And it's not always exciting, you know, but, uh, but um, you know, just looking at it all helps think about all of these materials in a different perspective, a different context. So sometimes super cool stuff, sometimes not. but. Uh, but I think it's going to be really useful to do. 
Yeah, so this is the research lab. One of the other spaces we renovated in this room is a teaching lab. So this is a space where, you know, classes that are too big actually to meet in the lab can have hands-on lab exercises. And this is Kelly Antal, she's a visiting professor um, in social sciences and she's a biological anthropologist and primatologist. So, Kelly? Yeah, welcome to the newly renovated uh, anthropology teaching lab. We're really excited about this space. Uh, the room itself fits about 15 to 20 students at a time, but what's great about having the building is even with a larger class, we're able to have some overflow. So my course that I'm teaching this semester, Biological Anthropology, has 30 students, and we're able to come here and do comparative analysis with uh, fossil casts and bone casts. So I can give you a little tour here of some of the items that we have. Um, of course, we have the skeleton here behind me, uh, our human skeleton, the modern human skeleton, and we also have uh, a cast of a, a skull of a chimpanzee and next to the very famous uh, Australopithecus afarensis known as Lucy. Many people know this specimen as Lucy, discovered by Donald Johansson in the 1970s. Um, what's great about this space too is while we have uh, our cast collection, uh, it is sometimes limited, so we're able to also use 3D models on the computer as well. So looking at something like this, Theropithecus, uh, an extinct form of baboon, we can then compare it uh, to a modern baboon skull. And using the 3D abilities, we can move all through the different planes here. Uh, one thing that I've been working on with the technology and innovation department at the Michigan Tech Library with Chad Arney and John Schneiderhan is to make our own casts of fossils using their 3D printer. So this here is the skull case of a species known as Homo nilati, just discovered two years ago, or just published on, I should say, uh, two years ago from South Africa, and some other examples of extinct ape species, uh, Afropithecus and Proconsul. So we're really excited to be able to have the space now where students can come, they can work with these, they have a hands-on experience, and uh, do this kind of comparative analysis. Yeah. Are we, going to, are we gonna check out the... Oh, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, you know, part of the reason that we made this the teaching lab is that we have this other room here where we can store our, our, our teaching collections. So we have these amazing wooden cabinets that we rescued from, from geology when they were getting rid of them, and it becomes a way that we can organize um, teaching collections so that we can, you know, identify the artifacts that we found, what is this metal thing, we have something to compare it to. Um, we can look at ceramics to look at different ceramic forms. Um, and we can create exercises for classes. So it becomes a really convenient way to um, store our, our artifacts and teaching collections that, you can't see anything in there, that students can actually help identify and, and uh, look, at, look at the artifacts themselves. So that's the collect teaching collections and the, uh, and the uh, teaching lab. This next room is what we call the Graduate Student Research Lab. So we have a, we have a graduate master's program in industrial heritage and archaeology as well as a PhD program. So students need to have some place to work on their own research and projects and they never had that before. So we've created this as a place where students can, you know, uh, work on their projects themselves. This is Brendan Doucette. He's a new master's student in IHA. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, so yeah, this is a, basically a, a faunal collection here that I'm working on. Uh, what I'm doing specifically right now is taking bones that we've excavated from uh, various lumber sites in the Hiawatha National Forest and pulling out good specimens from them and then laying them out here, which is making what we call a comparative collection. And that's really useful for examining um, animal bones because it's really hard to ID them without having some kind of collection to compare them to. So that's what I'm working on here, and you guys also came in at a pretty good time because 
but we've got these trays here uh, laid out. It's a pretty good um, idea of like what a you know basic funnel ID project goes like. So we'll clean all the bones and then basically just pour them out on a tray like this. And then the next step would be this tray right here, which is sorting everything um, based on like uh, you know what part of the body they come from or like animals. If you can just figure that out by looking at them at a quick glance. And then from here, we go into like identifying the specific bones, like what animal they belong to. And this is what the people with the body shapes eat, right? Correct, yeah. So um, you can see like a lot of them, they're sawed here. Um, so that would be, you know, um, just getting different cuts of meat and a lot of butchery marks on these bones. Like here's another really good example right there. And that's pretty common with the, the larger long bones like this. This one's one of my favorite one. because it has all of these cut marks. So one of the things that we've been looking at is how are these animals processed? How do they get their meat? And some of the, the it's, it's so obvious that they're not professionally butchered. That somebody didn't really know um, how to deal with that. And um, James' um, dissertation is going to be looking at provisioning uh, in this lumber camp. And I think Brendan is interested in wild game. And so a lot of what we've been finding from some of these deposits is a lot of fish that meant that uh, some of these some of these lumber camp workers probably in their spare time or some of their children were out hunting or fishing to augment their diet. So a lot of a lot of research potential with this bone. Collections are crazy. We had there's just so much bone from this site. You know, one feature we had 15 boxes of artifacts. 14 of them were animal bone. <laughs> well, and did you um, know that before you did, agreed yeah. to do this? <laughs> well, I think James said that um, these people, these men in the logging camps were burning like 10,000 calories a yeah. day. So they were eating <laughs> giant meals yeah. as often as they could. <laughs> yeah, so they, the, the USDA caloric intake for a lumberjack is a lot different <laughs> than the typical modern American. So you have a lot of bone. Thanks, Thanks Brandon. Yeah, no problem. And the, uh, the other main room we have is our computer lab and GIS lab. And this is uh, Tim Scarlett, another faculty in IA, to talk about his work. Thanks, Luann. And welcome to the GIS lab in the archaeology annex and, and for the uh, Department of Social Sciences at Michigan Tech. Um, I think you've been getting a feel for the flow of research as things come in on projects students are doing from the field through cleaning and processing analysis uh, and identification up to larger analytical questions. And that's one of the things that happens here because this is one of our GIS labs around campus. We've got uh, some more facilities down in the Great Lakes Research Center. There's more facilities upstairs and office spaces and things like that. Uh, but in, in this particular area is a classroom for us for working through uh, different kinds of geospatial research questions because all archaeological studies are geospatial. And so students work on a lot of different kinds of applications here, from the analysis of their material, of, of artifacts from excavations, to bigger picture questions about landscapes and uh, the evolution of the industrial world. Um, there's a couple of things I've put up on the monitors for people to see student projects that they're working on. Over here on the big screen um, is an, an aerial photo in a, one of our web-based GISs of the area around Pullman National Monument. And really quickly, as you're as you're looking at that, I'm going to click on a couple of things. What the students have done here is to superimpose uh, georeferenced historical fire insurance maps um, um, on top of the, um, there we go, there it is, on top of the uh, resource. And so these you can look at to various degrees of scale. Um, and by having them georeferenced and placed one on top of the other, um, we can see all kinds of interesting things um, as they evolve over time in the landscape. This group of students has been looking at the change in the process of how this factory operates. So for example, if you watch here for a moment, I'll flip this, but this is a factory um, uh, for the Pullman Palace Car Company in Chicago, Illinois, a, a world famous place for making uh, uh, passenger cars for trains. Um, and you can see uh, this map, which shows the process of building these cars from 1911. Um, and what the students have done in setting things up initially is to make it so that uh, we can go forward in time. 
This is 1938, and look at how those, those processes have evolved and changed, different work areas and different work spaces. Um, and uh, this one is earlier in time, going, going back to older sites from 1892, before they were making steel cars, when all the trains were made of wood. And I've also, as, as you look around this uh, uh, area, where you can see various student workstations and things like that, um, I put up on the other monitor over here another example of a big collaborative project um, from the Keweenaw Time Traveler, which uh, anybody out there can go look at at keweenawhistory.com. Um, and um, uh, the Time Traveler is where all of these kinds of GIS projects head, that as that data becomes geospatial, as it gets integrated, um, each little piece that a particular student might work on or a particular faculty member might work on um, um, gets drawn into this larger connected database that makes it easily accessible to people. And all data, from scientific data, like remote sensing imagery, to uh, um, um, studies of wildlife and fish populations and, and the sediment load of streams, um, to historical data, census records, telephone directories, economic records, tax records, photographs, diaries, can all be drawn into this geospatial process. So here in the time traveler, um, if I switch over, um, uh, well, other, switch over on the other computer here, um, you can see some examples where, again, we've got fire insurance maps overlaid on top of, of aerial photographs, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit, um, on different buildings. And uh, uh, they're set up now at a point where you can select a building, and then you can start to sort and search through this information, finding out who lived where, or backing up and starting with a person and finding out where they lived. You could look at the clustering in space and time of communities uh, that belong to particular churches or belong to particular ethnic groups, uh, people with different kinds of jobs. Um, uh, ultimately, this all becomes a public face for an interface for people to do, communities to participate in their heritage, because people will be able to, to, to log on and use this. There are games involved in this with people helping to identify the maps, what kinds of building materials and uses buildings were put to. But then, eventually, as it gets through the version 2, version 3, version 4, people will be able to start adding their own photos, their grandmother's letters. Um, all these different kinds of records that then researchers and other users will be able to interact with. This kind of community-facing work and community-based work where our students are out in the community um, scanning and, and, and teaching and working with young students and working on uh, creating these geospatial networks that connect all different kinds of information, making information available to people and allowing people to share that information with each other. Um, these are all the kinds of things that go on in this room. Do you have any other kinds of questions or thoughts about the way we're using geospatial technologies here on campus? I think we're just, you know, yeah. telling the we're, people what we're doing. And sure, we're, there, I mean, there are so many things that we're doing here that are connected in so many ways from scanning three-dimensional models of, of artifacts like uh, Dr. Antel is working with in the other room, um, where students can 3D print them for, for sharing and analysis. We, we, we're connecting with remote sensing. We were doing some, some projects. I have a meeting very shortly um, uh, to talk about uh, uh, spectral imaging, thermal imaging, and LIDAR, uh, and, and ground penetrating radar data fusion at the site of the Quincy Smelter. Um, we're, we're, in, we're connecting with all these different departments on campus, as archaeologists always do, uh, because we're infinitely curious about people in the past and, and, um, and the past worlds. Um, um, and we need, therefore, kind of an infinite toolbox to get at that fragmentary information to build bigger and bigger pictures of things that are going on. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to show you a couple of things, and unfortunately, the GIS students are all in class right now, which means that no one's actually in this room. They're all down at the Great Lakes Research Center. But uh, um, uh, do uh, go to QAnonHistory.com and check out the Time Traveler and see it as it evolves. And um, uh, it's all going to be, it, or it is already web enabled, so that if you have a tablet with a cellular data for our package, you can walk around the Copper Country and you can flip through these historic maps. It follows you where you're going. Um, and you can start to sort that data on the spot, on demand, um, um, as um, um, people begin to tell their own stories with the place where they live.
And don't forget that next week is the 25th anniversary celebration of the department. There's going to be tours of the Copper Country. There's going to be alumni engaging in roundtable discussions about you know, where the program has been and where it's going. And uh, we anticipate it's going to be a really excellent um, exploration of the past as a way to uh, know where we're going in the future. So thanks for joining us today on this live tour. We hope you've enjoyed it. And um, again, this is the Archaeology Lab at Michigan Technological University.